Why on earth did Peter, James, and John fall asleep at this privileged time? They and the rest of the disciples fall asleep during Jesus' agony in the garden as well. In Luke's telling, Jesus doesn't single out Peter, James, and John to pray with him in the garden. He's learned his lesson on this mountain. Luke does tell us why they all fall asleep in the garden. Grief. Maybe that's why the three fall asleep on the mountain. Jesus has just told them he's going to be killed. We sleep at inappropriate times, too, like during homilies, (laughs) or during Lent, or during Lenten homilies. At least regarding Lent in general, I'm not talking about physical sleep. In fact, it might even be a good discipline for many of us during Lent to learn how to practice getting a good night's sleep. Students, are you listening? You know the drill, sleeping regular and sufficient hours, turning off our screens and relaxing before bedtime, eating well and exercising. As the um, monk, when the monk went to uh, his spiritual um, guide, he says, well, tell me how, what great spiritual advice do you have? And the guide said, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired. Actually, I've learned to pray and sleep at the same time, not eat, but um, my favorite time of the day is in the morning after I've exercised, eaten, and sung the psalms with the brothers, when I go back to bed to pray for an hour. Horizontal meditation, I call it. If I keep accepting rather than fighting the restlessness of my mind, if I keep giving myself over to God, not looking for any results, just trying to give myself to God, I often eventually fall back to sleep if I need it. If I am rested, my mind usually, finally, quiets for a bit. Sometimes I'm not sure if I've fallen asleep or prayed, or whether there's any real difference if I just did what I could to fall into God's embrace as Luciana gives herself over to her parents' loving embrace. But Lent definitely isn't a time to be spiritually asleep. What brings on spiritual sleep in us? As with the disciples, grief is one thing thing that can induce such a stupor. Other forms of pain like fear or emptiness can also lead us to anesthetize our spirit. We might instead seek relief from pain through pleasure-seeking or other methods, but they put us to sleep as well. Actually, it's not clear in today's story when the three... when the three were overcome with sleep. Maybe it wasn't before Jesus' transfiguration, but during it, because of it. Was it too much for them? Father John Paul knows this well. When I go to a really loud action movie, I sometimes fall asleep because of sensory overload. At any rate, at some point during the transfiguration, they became fully awake. Maybe like when I finally decided to give in to the nodding off at that loud action movie, that's when a huge bang will wake me up. Had today's scene on that mountain gotten even more intense? Or had the movie taken a turn of events that grabbed their attention? Apparently it got good enough that Peter wanted to replay the moment over and over and build a movie theater, a multiplex even. Let us make three tents. But he didn't know what he was saying, Luke tells us. So if Lent isn't about spiritual sleep, it's also not about mindless chatter or manic, misdirected activity. How many of us fall into mindless multiplication of our prayers during Lent? Or try to take the spiritual bull by the horns during Lent and get our lives together in a burst of activity? We're going to do this, not do that, pray just so, Figure it all out. Peter was excited because he'd finally 
figured it out, or so he thought. There really is something special about this Jesus, he's thinking. Jesus is hanging out with the big boys, Elijah and Moses, and his face is all shiny, his clothes suddenly stunningly laundered. We operate as if at some point during Lent we're going to get it all figured out, and then it will be time for us to enshrine the experience and camp out on the mountain. A further benefit for Peter and his boys would be that if they could just keep Jesus up there shining bright, they wouldn't have to go down the mountain and learn to shine bright themselves. Like Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai, or, or they wouldn't have to go down the mountain and fail to shine. But at least they're awake. And there's something to be said for whatever huge bang wakes us up, even if the bang is a crash a Lenten fast day, a crisis, or some other bracing experience. Peter and James and John wake up, and that's when the movie takes a scary turn. A cloud came over and cast a shadow over them. Actually, not a cloud, the cloud, the Shekinah, God's awesome Old Testament presence in the tabernacle, the temple, the burning bush, the pillar of smoke, the fire and smoke on the mountain, Sinai. The darkness, that deep, terrifying darkness that enveloped Abraham in today's Genesis scene, where there appeared a smoking fire pod and a flaming torch. The cloud appears, and then we get a funny line about Peter and his boys. And they became frightened when they entered the cloud. Weren't they scared already? Why on earth did they enter that scary cloud? Was it that they couldn't resist God's awesome presence, scary as it was? Then they hear in Dolby surround sound, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. They thought they'd already listened and gotten it. Did they now finally really get it? God's son, not just the Messiah, as Peter had professed shortly before this scene. God's son. And he is to be listened to, the voice says. Really listened to. No more falling asleep when he tells you he's going to suffer and be killed. It's time to stay awake and walk with him. And no more ignoring the other part of what Jesus said, which went by really quickly, that part about how on the third day he was going to be raised. If what happened on this mountain is any sign of what's possible, maybe that part about being raised could really happen. Would you enter the cloud Will you, this Lent, enter the cloud of God's presence? We have our big two-evening Lenten retreat and concert next Monday and Tuesday. And we join the whole Catholic world in an evening of adoration and reconciliation later that week on the first Friday in March. And another evening of reconciliation the following Tuesday when five priests will be itching to remind you of God's love and mercy. And on the weekend between the women's retreat and the Burundi border barrio reflection on immigration advocacy, plenty of clouds to choose from, including also the scary but inviting cloud of quiet prayer. A place where God is in charge, not us. Today, in just a few minutes, will we be stout-hearted as today's psalm proclaims and enter the cloud of the Eucharist with courage? Will we allow our praying of the special Eucharistic prayer of reconciliation to transform us? Will we recognize that that in communion, we're inviting the cloud inside of us? That's right, we no longer have to enter the cloud. The cloud enters us. Jesus' spirit is the Shekinah dwelling within us. 
on that mountain after the mysterious and awesome voice in the cloud, instead of falling asleep, Peter and the others fall silent. No more, no more chattering ridiculous words about frenetically doing empty tasks. Not even any more unvoiced rantings of the mind. Just falling into a deep silence that goes beyond sleeping or wakefulness. A quiet that knows, even if it doesn't control or always feel, God's abiding presence. Falling silent.